Uh, hello, I'm Giacomo De Stefano, the director of the Patterson Museum, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us uh, for this presentation, which is actually a component of our current exhibit, which is Patterson Great Falls from Power to Park. It's actually curated by uh, Heather Garside. She's joining us this evening, and she's also serving as our IT person. I would also like to thank at this time the uh, Patterson Museum Foundation for providing the Zoom platform that, you know, able to share these presentations with everyone. Uh, for tonight's presentation, it's actually be more a conversation. And you're also can be part of the conversation in the uh, Q&A section as things are going along. If something comes to mind you'd like to ask, uh, feel free to type it in and Heather will uh, address it and uh, we'll answer the question as best as possible. Uh, we all know Patterson is known for many things. Uh, you know, for some, it, it's the city that was founded by Alexander Hamilton. For others, it was this powerhouse, you know, the industrial center, the Silk City. But, you know, the, the most identifiable thing with Patterson, of course, is we're the city by the falls, the Great Falls. You know, their flow began about 12,000 years ago with the uh, receding glaciers from the last ice age. And they've been enjoyed by people for about 10,000 years. Uh, you know, the very first hunter gatherers who were inspired and awed by these falls, uh, it, that experience is still shared today by uh, the people who here only yesterday. The weather wasn't that great today, so we didn't see as many, but uh, someone else could tell us about that. Uh, but, you know, the falls over the last few years has actually had a partner to enhance this visitor experience. And uh, that partner is the National Park System. And we do have an expert with us tonight, and he holds the distinction of being our very first superintendent. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. Darren Bach. Thank you, Jack, for that wonderful introduction. Yes. And I want to thank uh, you, Jack, and, and Heather, and the members of the foundation and the Patterson Museum staff. Um, it's, been a, it's been 10 years, and all along that whole decade plus, uh, Jack, you in particular, as a partner, have been right alongside everything we've been doing right up the street from you. And um, just to, to be able to continue this relationship going forward, um, it's, it's gratifying to have someone who's been in your chair as long as you have, um, I think three times longer than I've been in my chair. So, <laughs> and, and, and you were the most pleasant surprise because I always knew we should have been a national park, but I got to be honest, for the longest I was a non-believer, I didn't think it was going to happen. And I'm, I'm so glad to be proven wrong sometimes. Yes. Well, here we are. Well, yeah. Tell us a little about you, Darren. I mean, we, we know the title, but how did you get there? And, you know, what training and who, who's Darren Bach? <laughs> yeah. Who is Darren Bach? Well, Darren Bach, for starters, I guess uh, one of the one of the most important did you knows is I, I am a Patterson native. I was born in Barnard Hospital uh, on Thanksgiving uh, evening uh, in 1965. So there you get very specific. Uh, you now have my age. Um, I wasn't raised in Fair in the Patterson though. I was raised in Fairlawn, just over the over the river. Uh, my grandparents, however. Um, worked in Patterson for many years. They were, they were garment workers and um, they used to uh, sew men's suits in a mill in Patterson. And my grandfather used to take me when I lived with my grandparents in the, uh, in the 70s, they used to take me into Patterson. He had to buy his Italian bread. Um, <laughs> I, think in, I think it might've been Lazari's. I, I, can't, I can't remember for sure the name of the place, but I remember the smell. Uh, of my father's 1972 Plymouth Duster, uh, filled with the aroma of Italian bread that we had to get in Patterson. He would not get it anywhere else. So, so I have a real um, family link to the city. My my aunt and uncle uh, had their first home here. My my uncle Al uh, Morocco was actually a bat boy for the Negro Leagues at Hinchliffe Stadium back in the in the late 30s. So Patterson always loomed large. Uh, even as a child growing up here in the in this metro area, I, I used to watch Abbott Costello on WPIX Channel 11 on Sunday mornings at 11:30. And you know, I knew Abbott Costello. I knew Lou Costello was a was a Patterson favorite son, and so therefore he became one of my favorite uh, entertainers as a as a young as a young boy, and up to this day. So. So yeah, it, it was, I was fortunate to be able to 
uh, become the first superintendent of the Patterson Great Falls because other than just a professional step in my relatively short National Park Service career, for me, it became a labor of love because the city meant so much and means so much to people that are, that are in my family. So I think you've been I, training for this job your whole life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's the job I've been at longer than any other job in my whole life. I don't think I ever broke five years anywhere. And now I've broken a decade here. And um, my, my Park Service career before that was relatively brief. I was only in the agency for five years. Uh, it was really my third career, the National Park Service. And I was the chief of public affairs for all the national parks in New York City. So Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, Gateway, a bunch of sites in Manhattan. And so I had a very short um, you know, time horizon in the agency. And when I heard in 2011 that there'd be a new park that I knew was brewing at this point, but when it finally got established, uh, I threw my hat in the ring. And um, the re I think the region, the, the National Park Service, even though I had relative inexperience, uh, took a chance on me, and um, and I haven't looked back since. So yeah, it's uh, it's been a great ride, and it it continues. Uh, it's been a roller coaster at times. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm alone in that car, but other times, like tonight, uh, we're all going down and up uh, together as partners. So it's um, it's it's been both personally and professionally very rewarding for me to be here in Patterson, the city of my birth, working for the National Park Service, an agency that really everybody can wrap their hearts around. Uh, not, not a lot of controversy when it comes to the, uh, to the arrowhead and, and the, the federal government as represented by this agency. Just a little bit, whenever I think National Park, you know, we're all thinking like the Grand Canyon, you know, it's, it's always out west and, the, and these amazing vistas. Give me a little bit more about what the National Park is, what it does, and, and what it means to have a National Park in your in community. Well, first and foremost, it, it means a great deal only for the fact that, relatively speaking, there's so few. Uh, there's uh, 423 units in the system as of now. When Patterson was established in 2011, there was we were the 397th unit of the National Park System. So you're, you're talking Alaska, the continental U.S., Hawaii, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, Americans, you know, there's there, there 400 some odd units across that expanse is not that many. So the significance in and of itself is, is there's so few. And there's so few because really the criteria to become a national park by its very nature, the name national Park Service, really what that denotes is that the significance of the resource, whether it's natural, cultural, historic, or in our case, we have all three resources, but the reality is to become national, you have to be significant as, as an example of something um, that isn't just found everywhere. So, uh, you know, you, Jack, you mentioned great iconic Western sites, you know, like the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, the first national park, which was Yellowstone. Um, but re the reality is that that's only 70 some odd of the 420 uh, that are national parks. Uh, most of the other places are sites of uh, where something historic happened, a national historic site or a national memorial or a national monument, a national battlefield, or in the case of Patterson, a national historical park, which has across two sides of a river resources again that are both cultural historic but also we have the great falls which is natural so uh so really it's it's it it's significant in the fact that not many cities or areas or locales can lay claim to having it, a national park in their backyard is there a difference from when you say we're a national park or a national historical park well there is in the designation but they're all a power a part of the national park system so most often, again, uh, the natural sites will just be nas national parks in their designation, which has been designated by Congress. Congress decided that the Patterson Great Falls would be a national historical park because the collection of resources that we would preserve and interpret 
for the public really center uh, upon the importance of Patterson historically, less about the Great Falls as a natural resource, but more about the fact that Patterson was America's first planned industrial city founded by founding father Alexander Hamilton. So that's, that's the central point of what makes the Great Falls nationally significant and important for all of the nation is what transpired here historically. Um, I know most people coming to see the Great Falls are coming for the Great Falls as a, in their, in their own right, the Great Falls are, they're a national natural landmark um, that was designated in 1967. So the Park Service also manages the National Landmark Program. So you have a lot of national register sites, national historic landmark districts like the Great Falls uh, and other landmarks that aren't at the status of being a national park, but have that, that designation from the Department of Interior. So, and Patterson has a, a number of them. The raceway itself, the raceway system that winds through the city is a historic American engineering record uh, landmark. So, uh, but having the status of national park as a part of the system, very rare bird indeed. And um, we have it here. Right. Do you need to go through all those other steps, those, the, the, the landmark status, the engineer, do, do those normally help build the case for a national park or are they independent? I, it, they're independent, but I, I certainly, I, I wouldn't imagine it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt your argument uh, to have so much uh, uh, resources of import already recognized by the national federal government that you, you then can parlay that into uh, making an argument for national park uh, status. But ultimately, Congress decides, uh, there are acts of Congress that establish parks, except for the Antiquities Act, which gives the president some authorities alone to establish national uh, monuments and memorials. So the president does have some, some authority on his own to, to establish some units, but units such as a national park or a national historical park like Patterson requires an act of, uh, an act of Congress, an act that um, was passed in 2009, and ultimately the park was established in November 7, 2011. And, and what department do you fall under of the federal government? It's the Department of the Interior, which again, most people associate with the West because Interior is a land management agency, and you know the federal government is uh, the largest landholder in the United States, and uh, in, not just Interior, Department of Agriculture, other, other federal departments have land, but uh, Interior is the one in which the Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Bureau of Land Management, um, United States Geological Service, and a couple of others I'm sure I'm forgetting, but we're all under this cabinet level department uh, called the Department of Interior as a part of the uh, federal government. Now, now we're a partnership park, right? Can right, you, um, it you... really, that that term is, is um, it's not unique to Patterson. It's uh, it's actually almost all national parks to some degree or another are partnership parks. But what it means here, as you're looking at, at the resources that comprise this partnership park is that we're not doing this alone. So a lot of the resources you can see in this photo, you can see Hinchliffe Stadium way up on the, on the north end here, which is currently under construction. Um, that's owned by the city of Patterson, actually by the, by the city's uh, school system. Uh, the raceway system, which isn't here, the canal system is owned by the city of Patterson. Uh, the, the Valley of the Rocks, Mary Ellen Kramer, are also owned by the city of Patterson and will continue to be. So a partnership park is the federal government not just coming in acquiring land and, the, un, and putting the United States flag on it, but partnering literally with usually other local and state governments in order to partner together on, on the stewardship and the management of these resources. So we're, we're never gonna be doing this just Uncle Sam on this landscape. This landscape will always have the city, the county and the state involved on some level developing these resources.
Now, is that something that's built in? Like, how do you create the legislation? You have just the basics to get this national park running. Who, who does all that? And is all this built into it? I mean, is it's not free flowing. You have like a whole program and an outline that's set up, you know, before you start moving things. Correct. Yeah, well, once the legislation passed, the next step, which really consumed a good four years of, of our time, was for the park. Um, the, the, this is the president signing the authorization in 2009. And then two years later, uh, the parks established here in this photo, you see the Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar, on the right, signing the uh, general agreement with the city of Patterson, represented here by by former mayor Jeff Jones, they're signing the agreement that established the park. And that agreement set into motion, Jack, what you're referring to as a partnership park, that agreement, um, which anybody can read, go to the National Park website, you can, you can read that agreement and figure out what it's all about. But that really stipulates kind of the relationship that this partnership park would ha will have going forward. And then following this establishment, we had a, a, a multi-year, multi-partner effort to do what's called a general management plan. And that was required by the legislation. And um, that general management plan really describes what are the desired resource conditions over the course of 20 years? What do we want, what do, what do we want this park to be about? It's like a strategic plan. Uh, what Heather is showing right now is the, is the uh, front cover of what's called the foundation document, which is a shortened version, more or less, of the general management plan for the park. So I, I would, again, something else that's available on our website. It's very short. This really get, is a great primer on the Patterson Great Falls on what are the resources we have, what makes them nationally significant, what are the stories that the National Park Service is charged with interpreting here at this national park? And this document is a great tool for helping people understand uh, what the park is all about. How was the, the, the basic boundaries of the park? I know we had the original, like about 100, 1920 when they did the historic landmark status, but what part of that or how much of that actually became a national park? And well, well it, during the, uh, during the early, you know, hearings for national park status, you know, various uh, ideas were thrown out as to what would comprise the, the national park boundary. One of them was the, the entirety of the 118 acre national historic landmark district should be the boundary, but that would create some obvious problems because a lot of that boundary has privately owned uh, properties in it. So here, what we have is about 52 acres in that 118 and ultimately those 52 acres are all publicly owned and that's what en that's what ended up when congress uh established the park that they decided that acreage that was in the domain of already of public uh government uh, local governments would be the ones that would that would uh comprise the boundary and this is a great rendering of we have in our park brochure that shows generally speaking, the core of the park resources on either side of the river. So, so you have 52 acres. How many people do you have to manage that? Or <laughs> what is, you know? That's... Not enough. Um, well, right now, uh, it's a, that's a good question. Uh, we had 308,000 people last year come to the Patterson Great Falls. Uh, it's the third time uh, we've broken the 300K mark uh, since we've been keeping formal visitation records for about six years now. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a lot of people, and um, you know we do what we can to to maintain the resources, to serve those visitors, to develop the kind of programs and projects that people expect when you have the Arrowhead. That is a uh, iconic brand that then you have, you know, the park ranger in uniform. There's an expectation that visitors have that the place will rise to the level of a national park experience. And so I don't have a very relatively speaking large number of people to 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 do that, but um, a very nimble and very talented group of people um, 
that's one of them right there. That's Elise Goldman, who's my chief of, edu uh, of interpretation and education. So she's the supervisory ranger that oversees most of the staff at the park. They're the ones that do the day-to-day -day visitor services. And Elise was only the second employee who followed me uh, somewhere around eight months after, after establishment and after I was hired as the per first park superintendent. And I don't know if it's a testament to me or the park, but she's still around. So, uh, and uh, her staff has grown uh, a little bit over the past year, two years. So we're, we're, we're starting to be in a good place to welcome and serve. And Elise was pretty local too, wasn't she? Yes, Elise uh, is a fair, is, lives in Fairlawn. So she's just on the other side of the river, which is again, the town I grew up in. So we have a quick question, sorry, from the audience. They were wondering how you count the number of visitors to the, to the park. Yeah, it's a little bit of art and a little bit of science. So it, it's easy in that we have counters, we have pneumatic tubes at the entrance to the visitor center parking lot. So most of our visitation numbers are derived from the, the, the number of vehicles and we have formulas for devising the number of people that we average at each of those vehicles uh, that come in and out of the main parking lot. And then we also look at partner sites that are in the national park boundary. So for example, the Patterson Museum, my friends down the street, um, you know, some level of that visitation is also visiting the national park because they're in the Rogers Locomotive Building, which is in the park boundary, and they're visiting Jack, Jack's uh, Museum. Um, that's not always a separate number, but we have ways of calculating and averaging things out. So uh, primarily it's, it's parking, but it's also looking at events. Um, the park rangers rove with counters uh, to count, literally count numbers of people that they interact with. So there's a variety of different ways uh, we go about coming up with a number that, that we have confidence in. You mentioned events. What type of like public programming are you doing that would also help generate the numbers of visitors that come to us? Yeah, I we I mean we we've done we have a stable of project of programs I should say that have just kind of created a, a life of their own. That's one of them right here that you're showing. Um, this one was very uh, very special to me. Uh, these are these are Lenape. These are Native Americans from descendants of the Lenape tribe that was dispossessed of this land back in the 19th century. Most of the Lenape went to Oklahoma and Wisconsin and some to Canada. And these folks, this particular tribe, this is a mother and daughter and son, they came all the way from Oklahoma this summer uh, because we asked them to, to return to the Great Falls, an area that was very special to them and their descendants to come and do some programming, some dance, a drum, lectures to talk about the Lenape and their history here. So we, we, we want to, you know, continue this relationship with this tribe and others going forward. And we have over the number, number of years had Native American heritage festivals at the Great Falls. So we never lose sight of the fact that long before Hamilton and Washington picnic here, picnicked here at the falls during the Rev War, and then later in 1792, when this becomes America's first planned industrial city, there's a history that predates that, and that prehistory uh, it, it gives great opportunity for us to to educate the public on on the populations that preceded us, and I've, so we have a great relationship with this tribe um, here from Oklahoma, and we look forward to having them back uh, maybe this year or next, and growing that that annual recognition of the Native uh, Americans, and we usually do that obviously in in November because that's Native American Heritage Month. Um, we've had other events. We had art events. We have STEM events, which you're looking at here. Uh, we even did the um, the viewing. It was a one-off because it doesn't happen very often. We had the viewing of the, uh, uh, what's it called, Jack? Help me with it. Eclipse. The eclipse, yes. The, the big solar eclipse. We had over 2,000 people. I thought nobody's going to want to come here to watch an eclipse, so I bought 200 pairs of those glasses. Yeah, I remember we were expecting two, 300 people. I said two, 300. I bought them, had them in a box. <laughs> we had, and Jack, you were there. Yeah. You... Uh, we had thousands of people lining up down the street, the waiting, yeah. waiting for their turn to use a pair of $1 glasses. 
Um, so we have. I remember when you got real resourceful and you had the, the cardboard and you popped the holes in it. So you, yes. you, you, you make it with paper. I mean, yes. you, your Rangers really came up to figure different ways that you could experience this without going blind, looking directly at it. And that was awesome. Yeah, we had Rangers who are great with uh, what we call, used to, what I used to call in the Army, field expedient methods. <laughs> Coming up with stuff out of you know where just to figure it out. And that's, that's what they did. So um, the other event, uh, the jazz band, Heather, if you could pull that up, this was a wonderful opportunity. I, I also happen to be a United States Army veteran, and I, I, the Army has wonderful bands, marquee bands that perform internationally. And one of them is the Jazz Ambassadors, uh, uh, very highly rated. Uh, if you know anything about jazz, the U.S. Army Jazz Ambassadors decided to come to Patterson for the first time ever this summer. And just to be able to have the amphitheater at the base of the falls and have this kind of talent grace us, grace the park and, and create an opportunity for a cultural offering to the city of Patterson and to the larger community is, is a great opportunity. And this is something where the band had such a great time doing it there that they're, they're, they're looking at coming back uh, potentially after our new visitor center opens because it, it, it'd be difficult before that because the amphitheater uh, will, will probably not be available. So this is another opportunity for us to kind of become, you know, maybe a staple on their tour. You mentioned the Welcome Center. Uh, yeah, you, uh, this oh, is oh, a, we'll go with the other events first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is another one um, that we do annually, uh, the naturalization ceremony. You know, Patterson, founded by Hamilton, a, a, an immigrant in his own right. And um, obviously, it's an immigrant city, as are almost all cities in the United States. But uh, I reached out to United States Citizenship and Immigration Services years ago because I know they do ceremonies in various places. And I said, I have the best spot anywhere, probably next to Ellis Island, to do a, to, to where you would want to become a citizen. And that's right here in, in, a, in the city founded by, by the immigrant founding father Hamilton. So annually, usually in October, uh, CIS brings all of these folks in. Almost all of them are from Patterson. They're Patterson residents. They're, and they're being naturalized um, here at the base of the Great Falls in this photo. And it's, it's, I, it never fails to choke me up uh, every year when we do this event at the park. What else is on tap there, Heather? Any other events I, I missed? Oh, this is uh, recent. This is our 10 year anniversary in November. Uh, these are some partners, uh, Bob Garashi, who's with the New Jersey Community Development Corporation, and, and then Martin Vergara in the middle, and then to the right of him, Leonard Zacks, and then Arlene. They're all, um, they're all within Hamilton Partnership from Patterson. That's, that's our nonprofit uh, friends group. So another set of partners. And there we were cutting some cake for our 10-year anniversary. All right, we went through some of the public programming. Well, what are some of the improvements that people are going to see when, all right, the program? Hang on, we well, have a question, actually. Sorry. Okay. Um, we had a question about programming. So um, someone said that on a Sunday in January, they saw a group of dancers in garb, and they were wondering if that might have been the Native Americans coming to the, the park. Uh, not in January. That was a summer event. So we there's often permitted events. The city issues permits still for, for the amphitheater. Uh, and so there's a lot sometimes happen there that it's not even something that's happening in partnership with the park service. People can, can request to use the amphitheater for a dance or music or a graduation or a wedding. And uh, so uh, unless my staff corrects me later, whatever January event the questioner is referring to, to uh, I'm not, I, top of my head, I'm, I'm not familiar. Over to, Evan, well, let's look just real quick at the preceding 10 years. What's the physical difference that people have seen? What, you know, improvements have you made that, you know, that if the National Park wasn't there, weren't, wouldn't be there today? Yeah, I think, um, I think there, and there's a number of people that have returned. Uh, they haven't been to the park maybe six, seven, eight years, and they come back now, and they're 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 somewhat surprised at the fact that there's some real tangible evidence that some projects have been happening. So, and again, not happening 
just because the national park is here, Jack, but you know, um, it's a partnership park. So Mary Ellen Kramer Park uh, was rehabilitated in 2015. 2017, 2018, we rehabilitated Overlook Park uh, and in, included in, as a part of this rehabilitation, this amphitheater th that this uh, you're seeing now, uh, the amphitheater obviously with the falls would be behind you here. So Overlook Park was completely redone. Mary Ellen Kramer Park was completely rehabilitated. We, um, there's the entrance to Mary Ellen Kramer Park. We also, uh, we had a building that was uh, transferred to the United States from the city of Patterson that used to be the city's visitor center uh, for the Great Falls area. And we converted that into a new, uh, the park's first welcome center. So if you wanna back up right here, that's Congressman Pascrell, who was the first customer uh, purchasing items in, in the park's uh, welcome center. This is back in 2015. So this building, actually this past year, uh, we had closed it during COVID and rather than reopen it as a welcome center, we converted it to the park's maintenance building. So this is now our maintenance bay. And it kind of historically works because this building was a gas station uh, as recent as the 1960s, I believe. So uh, it's now somewhat of a gas station again, but we're gonna have a new visitor center that, that is gonna be serving the park and its visitors um, in the next couple of years. So rather than reopen this small, rather, uh, you know, uh, tiny welcome center, we're, we're just using it for maintenance. Okay. So these are some of the things that are gonna be happening in this next 10 years. Yeah, well, the next the next decade, I mean, it's going to include again a lot of a lot of partnership projects on the landscape that are going to serve to really, I think, enliven the visitor experience and people again that come back to the park after not having come back for maybe the past four or five years. Uh, I think the park is going to be virtually unrecognizable to some degree. I mean, the Great Falls will always be there and 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 be great. But we're going to have a, a new visitor center, a new park on the river called the Quarry Lawn. Uh, we'll probably be looking at rehabilitating resources that are along the raceway uh, system. Th this here image is a rendering um, of the Quarry Lawn. This, this will be the first major project to, to come online. Uh, the the uh, bids. Um, for this project actually were just announced this Monday. So potentially in the next three to four months, there'll be an award made and construction will commence on the quarry lawn. So this park, um, it's kind of off to the left side would be the Passaic River. This would be a part of the river walk. And then the great lawn would be that lawn that is large, about two acres of lawn behind those benches. And then that, that cliff face area uh, is the remains of what was what's called Mount Morris that was quarried out of the area in the 19th century. And then a bunch of mill buildings were all put here, but most of them are gone except for some select mill building ruins that we're actually gonna preserve and stabilize. So this park is gonna have a nice historical element to it because it's not just gonna be an open space on the river, as beautiful as it's going to be, it's also going to have some of those historic ruins that people are going to see jutting up right in the middle of the park to co to, to be able to interpret the long history of 150 plus year history of industry that occurred on this site. So it's going to be a very exciting park. Uh, I think people are going to love it. It's going to be it's going to be new in all respects because there never was a park here. There was a mountain here. Then there was a quarry. And then there was about 30 industrial buildings. And then there was a bunch of fires. And this area has been closed to the public since the early 80s. So what reclaiming this area or putting a new park in, it literally is new. There's never been a public park here. So is there going to be interpretive signage throughout so people know, oh, there was a factory here. Mount Morris was here. How, how are they going to know that? Yes, we have uh, what's called wayside exhibits. Those are park service signs you can find in virtually every national park that give you uh, just enough information to 
know what you're looking at. So we're going to have those wayside exhibits here in the quarry lawn. Okay. So yeah, this this should be, I mean, you know, construction is always an iffy thing to make any commitments on, and I'm not going to make it here, but this could start construction this summer and potentially maybe next summer or next fall, not this year, but the next one, we could be cutting the ribbon on the new quarry lawn. And again, a partnership project, the city of Patterson, state of New Jersey, the county of Passaic, everybody's involved. And there's a whole nice list of all of the uh, contractors on the bottom, the bottom gonna, of the slide. One question I always get is who's gonna own that quarry lawn or like the 52 acres? Is that always gonna be part of Patterson, part of the county, part of the state, part of the federal or? You know, uh, it both, own? all of the above. Uh, so this, uh, where the where Overlook Park is and Mary Ellen Kramer, the federal government, we're, we're actually actively doing a transfer now of those properties. This particular park, the Quarry Lawn, is going to remain the city of Patterson, but we have a cooperative management agreement with Patterson that we're going to work together on operating and maintaining this park. So even though it, the title to it will remain with the city, it's in the national park boundary. We're going to work together on, and we've worked together on designing it, and we're going to hopefully work together very closely on maintaining it. People, visitors don't care for the most part or know who has title to what piece of property. They're just coming for an experience. They do know it's a national park. They have expectations that if it's a, if it's a National Park Service site, that that's going to mean certain things as far as its upkeep and its programs and things of that nature. But again, oh, this is now and will continue to be a partnership park. And, and everything that entails. So wh where's the new visitor center going if the uh, old one is now the uh, maintenance shed? Well, Overlook Park, um, which is in this, in this rendering, the uh, steam plant foundation, which exists now is the gray concrete area uh, along the river. That's the remains of a steam plant that was demolished in 1962. You can see in the foreground, you see this part of the amphitheater, which we saw earlier showing here. That's all in existence. That's a part of Overlook Park. Now up top, the steam plant, when it was demolished, they repurposed it as a parking lot. So rather than take out the entire foundation, they put a deck on the foundation. And so when most people, if they're familiar with the Great Falls, when you visit, you drive in and you park in the parking lot that's up there. And then you make your visit to the national park. Our visitor center is here in this rendering is going to be three levels, a street level, which is going to be where the main exhibit hall is. And then a, a multi-purpose level. You can see the folks coming out kind of an indoor outdoor on the terrace, which is right above the, uh, the steam plant foundation. Heather, I don't know if you can run a pointer in the terrace area there, right there. So that's the multi-purpose area. So that's indoor, outdoor. You're going to be able to actually use that for events. You can get married in the amphitheater. You can have your reception uh, right there in a kind of a three season area. And then you'll be able to take an elevator down into the steam plant foundation, which is going to be all stabilized. And you'll be able to come out uh, and then you'll be a pedestrian. And then you can walk along the, the new river walk uh, Heather, which will take you right up into the new Quarry Lawn Park, which we we just talked about, and this this new visitor center here in Overlook Park will connect you right to the new Quarry Lawn Park. So this building has been in a design stage uh, for a very long time. We're actually still in the stage of designing the exhibits that are going to be in it, but the building itself is complete as far as the the the, the designs, the blueprints. And we're waiting to start construction on this sometime, maybe this summer, maybe early fall, uh, we'll start construction on this beautiful new 14,000 square foot visitor center. And, um, and we should open it sometime in the summer of 2024. So, so we, I've, we, I've we, learned we, that that seems far away, yeah. but in park service years, uh, we're gonna be opening this thing tomorrow. It's going to happen that fast. So, so these exhibits are going to complement the Patterson Museum. You're not putting me out of business, are you? No, no, not at all, Jack. Uh, you, no one could put you out of business. 
<laughs> you have a great museum with artifacts that really serve to illustrate in a very tangible way the history of the of the national park and the great falls and 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 the larger story of patterson as a city so nobody's ever going to replace that what i hope and what we have done for years as partners is people can get a sense of what's important at the visitor center but they can't see any of the real artifacts that 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 are behind all of those significant developments unless they walk a half a block down the street, which they'll continue to do after we have this new visitor center to go visit the Patterson Museum. Okay, I understand partnership now. Thank you. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's a great example of it right there. So, what other projects are going to be also going on? Or, I mean, these are two major ones. Yeah. What else is going to happen over these next? Well, few there's years? one happening right now, uh, Hinchliffe Stadium, uh, which is in the park boundary. The Congress acted in 2015, they added Hinchliffe to the boundary of the National Park, but the legislation very clearly said the Park Service shall not acquire the stadium, which is good because the thought of me operating a, a, a municipal sports stadium, um, you know, I would lose what hair I have left. So the stadium is under construction. There's a visit by myself and my staff uh, just a few months back. Um, meeting meeting with the uh, construction crew and our job really as a national park this this stadium's going to have its own exhibit uh and its own small visitor center with exhibits about the history in particular obviously of Hinchliffe Stadium but our job is going to be to partner with the city and the school system and those that are operating that visitor center to help tell the story of Hinchliffe and what why is the stadium here why is it important why is it in the national park boundary so that's going to be our role is really to to work with partners on events and ways to interpret uh the the resource that is here in the park and this should open in the fall of this year so it's not it's not very far away that we'll have a stadium um that's going to be serving uh the community as it was intended when it was first constructed back in 1932. It's been closed since 1997. So it's been a very long time since you heard the crack of a bat or the roar of a crowd or cheerleaders. Long time since you've heard any of that, but you're gonna hear it again here before this year ends. And that's very exciting. Well, there be any racing back there i know we had a long history for midget uh, car racing from 45 to 50 well there were some exhibition uh laps will that be able to continue or that yeah i'm not certain of the answer to that i don't, i've heard discussions of people that have a great desire to see uh midget car racing reintroduced uh, there are partners that have done great exhibits in the stadium and maybe at least at a minimum they can continue to maybe not race cars at full speed, but sure. I would hope given the history of the stadium as a central location to car racing in the thirties and forties, I would hope it could still be a place where enthusiasts for car racing can, can gather at Hinchliffe and, and be exposed to, to, uh, to that, to that hobby. One cool. of the, the one of the designation that made it significant and you mentioned that engineering uh, <clears throat> recognition for the raceway system. I mean, it's that early application of water power it's often the one problem I have when I'm explaining it to people. Oh, yeah, this is the raceway system. And they're like, well, when do you turn the water on? Yeah. Well, the water hasn't been on in a long time. <laughs> well, my problem was never explaining the water uh, not being in the system, but explaining there's, you know, when people looking for a race car yeah. in the raceway. And I have to explain that the raceway is is a canal, a water canal. <laughs> um, and that's what it's called. It moves water. At a high rate of speed, but you can't move goods or, or or boats on it, so it's not a canal; it's a raceway system. It's about a mile long. Uh, starts right up at the at the uh, at the Wayne Avenue Bridge. There's an inlet, and it winds through the national park and all the way through the city of Patterson. So, one of the things in our general management plan that I referenced earlier. It, a goal that we have as partners is to reintroduce and rewater this system. Probably the single most important extant cultural resource that that remains at the Patterson Great Falls National Park is this system. There's really no no other 
multi-tiered raceway system as intact of this kind anywhere in the United States. So this really is a uh, this really is important enough that we said, listen, we can't just have a ditch. What you're looking at here is a photo of water running through the raceway system. That water stopped running in 2010. So there's a lot involved to reintroduce the water. There's even more involved to be able to adequately operate and maintain that system after you reintroduce water. So um, we have some projects in front of us that might that might be the first green shoots, so to speak, as far as the ultimate long-term rehabilitation of the raceway system. The first thing is the uh, gatehouse, um, which is at the beginning of the system. This is a, uh, the gatehouse is the structure that has the old Libby's uh, hot dog uh, sign on top of it, which is no longer there because Libby's is no longer there as well. But anyway, that's the 1838 gatehouse. The gatehouse is, is basically underneath that. There's a mechanism that you controlled with a wheel and it would pull up a wooden, wooden barricades and then that would allow water to flow under the gatehouse and you would be able to control the volume. That apparatus that's in front at the foreground there is, is the later actual operating gate for the raceway system that went again all the way to 2010. This photo, I believe, Jack, if you, I think you told me back during Hurricane Irene, yes. the raceway system kind of created some flood mitigation because it filled with water and it, it actually water moved through the raceway system um, uh, during, the, during those flooding periods. So this is a photo from that time, but that's what it should look like uh, if and when it runs once again, and this building, excuse me, the gatehouse, we do have some National Park Service funds and we have some matching funds. So we hope to, uh, to maybe begin plans, design plans for rehabilitating the original gatehouse sometime in 2023. So that could be like one of the first real tangible projects since the park's been established that we're able to undertake is rehabilitating that gatehouse. So it'll have the look the way it did in 1838 and trying to find historic photos and or yes. lines of that period. Yes, so that the Park Service takes that very seriously, Jack. Um, historic rehabilitation projects have to really respect the integrity of the resource. And so the, the greatest extent feasible and practical, that building is going to look like 1838 when we're done with it. So we have a couple of questions, Darren. One is, sure. is there is the raceway connected in any way to the Morris Canal? No. No, it's different. It's different. It's separate. Yes. And it, then it, the Morris Canal is not too far from here, though. You can just you can actually take a uh, one of our trails just right off the raceway towards Garrett Mountain, and you can get to uh, to part of where the Morris Canal was. Right, they, the Morris Canal really Greenway. Fighting. Yeah. The, yep. the, you look at the her early history, 1828, and all the uh, Morris Canal was in the uh, SUM were always fighting because the Morris Canal would be stealing water from the Passaic River to keep its operation going while they needed the water to go to the raceway to power the mills. So there was stealing going on in 1828. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the um, way they saw it. <laughs> some things never change. But he only had one water source, and they were both drawing from it. Yeah, interesting. I didn't Another know that, Jack. Another question that we have is, are there any plans to have tours of the hydroelectric plant? That's a great question. Um, really, we, we could do that. We can accommodate that. It's an active operating <laughs> hydro plant. Uh, we would do that for special tours if we could get at least 10, maybe a dozen people that have a real interest in, in that. I'd have to talk to the hydro plant operator. There'd be a whole safety briefing and hard hats and, and ear protection. Um, we rarely have had tours of the hydro plant, but we could. So if there's a, if there's a real interest among a group of people, um, you would just have to contact the park and they would, you know, myself, and I would have to then have a conversation with the hydro plant operators about whether we could facilitate that, that uh, tour of the hydro plant. So the questions at the moment. What, what, uh, there was one question yeah. about the visitor's guide for the park. Is that available on your website to be downloaded? The brochure? 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The, uh, well, everything you need to know about uh, the park and visiting it, it, there's a plan your trip uh, button, I believe, on our on our website and all the information for visitors as far as time and 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 uh, facilities and all the things of that nature is all there. And even a lot of the plans and other things we referenced in this call are also on the on the park website. And all th if all of that fails, there's a public number to the park um, ranger staff that can answer all of your questions as far as visitation. Any other questions, Heather? Yeah, we just got a few more a couple, that just rolled in. Stuff, yeah. Um, so uh, there will be a functioning exhibit demonstrating how the water raceways, or sorry, will there be a functioning exhibit demonstrating how the water raceways convert uh, power to machines and mills? That is a great question. And that is a great idea. The idea is so great that it actually made the general management plan for the park. So we have long term, again, a goal is to rewater the raceway. And as a part of that goal, we also put in a water demonstration project. So uh, that can be done any number of ways, but maybe the Ivanhoe uh, powerhouse, which is right in the upper raceway park, maybe we can convert that to an active water wheel. You wanna show people how moving water turned a penstock or a wheel and how that turned a cam, you know, just kind of show the mechanism of how water actually powered something in the, in the, uh, in the 19th century. Another idea was the Colt gun mill, which is, um, which is in, in ruins right now, but we also have plans. And I know the city has been moving very diligently on getting funding to rehabilitate and preserve the, the Colt gun mill. We were thinking maybe we could power um, the, uh, the water wheel uh, for the Colt gun mill again and have the raceway run through the uh, ATP site there and back into the river through a, a, a spillway that used to go through the back of the Colt gun mill. So either of those, or there could be some other options, but yes, the, the short answer is someday, some way, somehow, I want water to move and I want you to see water moving through the system when you're here. And I also wanna show you that water powering something the way it would have powered something in the 19th century. So we actually have a comment as well. Um, Patrick said that there was a water channel that allowed the Morris Canal to send water to the SUM when the river ran, okay. ran low. He said it was um, where Levine Reservoir uh, was eventually built in, the 18, in 1886, so. Oh, wow, okay. We had one more question. Uh, are there volunteer opportunities at the park? Yes, yes, we have a, a, a VIP program, which stands for volunteers in parks. Uh, most national parks have them. We have a, a core of volunteers that do various things in the park. And when we have large events or other staffing needs, you know, we just open it up to our VIPs to come assist us. So if you're interested, I would reach out to the park staff and say, I'd like to be a VIP. And then the uh, the staff would kind of give you the next steps. It's 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 kind of whatever you want to put into it. I mean, there's some initial commitment to get the proper training and 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 background to be a VIP. But once you are one, it's not like you have a set number of hours or commitments. It's just you're kind of there. And when we're doing something, you could offer yourself up. Um, it's a great way to serve your community and and to to help um, the national park as well. Yeah, and your volunteers do a variety of things. You know, I know Terry does photographs and uh, yeah, and we, Jennifer we does talks and yeah. Talks and right, visitor services. And even when we had our welcome center and we're gonna have this new beautiful Alexander Hamilton Center here that we talked about, oftentimes visitors will be the ones that, uh, I mean, uh, volunteers will be the ones that visitors first interact with at the store or at the gift shop. So opportunities uh, I think will abound in the, new, uh, in the new visitor center once we have that open. That was a great segue. Our next question is um, about the visitor center uh, and well, so basically the, the lack of a gift shop right now at the Great Falls. Um, and they were wondering if there's a way that that could temporarily be moved to the museum or somewhere else so that souvenirs would still be available before your, uh, the, the new visitor center opens. 
Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, a lot of people actually inquire and ask about um, wanting to buy uh, gifts related to the park. So we have a nonprofit partner called Eastern National, and they operate about 90% of all the gift shops across all the national parks. So um, they are, they when we closed the Welcome Center during COVID, and then we subsequently converted the building to a maintenance building, they, they took all their inventory out. It really belongs to them. And with the knowledge that we're gonna build this beautiful new visitor center, they'll take that inventory and then some and put it back in the new center. So in the time being, in the interim, there's just a couple of products about Patterson that you could buy online on Eastern National's website. But for the most part, any point of purchase uh, for, for those items is, is going to be uh, unavailable for you uh, or anybody until we have the new visitor center. And I don't think Jack wants to operate a store. <laughs> we're, right now, we're just trying to operate the museum. We've been yeah, yeah. sadly close to the public, but I guarantee we'll be open sometime before April. Okay. That'll right. give people an opportunity to see the the exhibit that you know spurred on your talk here from uh, you know the, the Great Falls from power to from power to park. We're going to keep that up to June twenty fifth. That's so great. It's a great exhibit. I'm pleased to be a part of it. We've got one more question, um, Darren. Do you think that parking is going to need to be expanded in the future with all your your extra visitors? Well, the visitor center project is a part of three projects that are all all funded in part by by some uh, state tax credits. And a part of that uh, very complex, confusing funding scheme, it required a garage. So right next to the, where the visitor center is gonna be constructed on right on McBride is gonna be a new two, 270 vehicle uh, four deck parking garage. So we will have new parking when we have a new visitor center. A lot of parking. Will that parking be free or for charge? Well, that's another thing that National Parks is going to have to run. No, no, that no, no, we're not running stadiums or parking garages um, <laughs> or museums. So not here. No, the uh, the garage is uh, is is going to be owned and operated by the Patterson Parking Authority. Okay. I have a question. So, oh, okay. Darren, what is your... I didn't your... plant this one. This is... <laughs> what I is your plant... favorite part of your job? Wow, my favorite part of my job. Um, it's this would sound, this is going to sound really canned and trite because, but it's, it really is, it really is the, uh, the partners and friends that I've been able to make over 10 years in the city. Uh, you guys, I mean, it, you know, it's pleasurable to have a lot of people and partners who really care about what we're trying to accomplish here. And they're, they're not just at the periphery, they're really like, like the museum, you guys are leaning forward, working with us. Uh, you're doing a whole exhibit about the, 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 you know, the park. So, and there's many other partners, um, nonprofit, educational, academic, partners uh it runs the whole gamut um there's just a, a lot of great people you meet that have an interest and a passion in this place that if that did not exist this would be a real lonely existence for any i think for any park manager but i i have no lack of passionate partners uh to help build the national park experience worthy of the name here in the city of my birth. So yeah, that's what that's what makes the job fun. And I have a great staff too. I have I have I have uh, no headaches when it comes to the people that work for the park. A little agita on occasion, Jack, which you know, being from Patterson, being a half Sicilian like I am, you know we all get a little agita on occasion, but very little of it from anybody uh, that works uh, works for me at the park. A little rain must fall into each day, you know? Yes. <laughs> Darren, we did have one last question. Yes. Um, so they're asking if there is an overview map that shows the parking garage and the visitor center, and I'm assuming the quarry lawn, all in one. 
Yeah, no, we've got all those individual renderings that you pulled up, Heather. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have anything on design yet on the garage to share. Uh, I mean, you can pull, if you pull, pull up, go back to the park map, Heather, and I can, you can yeah. maybe use your cursor to do a little terrain pointing out really where these things are real quick. You have that one image from the park brochure. Yeah, here, hang on. They go way, way back to the right there, yeah. So yeah, just to point out, so um, right where the cursor is, is the current uh, is where the parking the new parking garage is going to be where the cursor is that's a surface mm -hmm. lot now that's going to be the new parking lot heather if you move the cursor just north right into the wood line mm -hmm. that whole area there all the way up to close to the cult gun mill ruin which you can see that's the new quarry lawn park that whole area in the wood line now if you go to the left heather to the overlook park parking lot mm -hmm. that's the current parking lot and that's where the new Alexander Hamilton Visitor Center is going to be constructed. And then if you go south to the building where the maintenance building is, that right there is the is the now the what used to be the Welcome Center, which is now the park maintenance building. And then if you go across the river, you have Mary Ellen Kramer Park just on the other side of the footbridge. And then right next to that, obviously, you have a very imposing stadium Hinchliffe stadium right there um so really the, that that kind of addresses uh most of the resources and then the raceway system since you, you didn't really get to see it um you could see where it enters under mcbride avenue there where the cursor is that's where the gatehouse is right there yep and then that system runs through Upper Raceway Park. It has a head race and then parallel to it running a little bit lower is called the tail race. And then it goes under Market or Long Market Street, Van Houten, and then all the way out off, off the off camera, all the way to the right, it runs back out to the Passaic River. So that's the that blue line running through there is shows where the raceway system uh, is. And obviously this shows it with water in it. Uh, which again is our is our goal. So ho hopefully that helps um, uh, people have a better understanding of of all the pieces of the geography here that we've been talking about. Um, so the next question is, uh, what about pedestrian safety when crossing the streets in the park? Well, it's a, it's like any other urban area. Uh, you've just got to be aware of your surroundings and uh, follow the rules, but realize that there's a lot of people around you that aren't following the rules. So uh, fortunately, as far as pedestrians, I'm not aware of any, any significant accident over the decade I've been here with a park visitor um, being struck by any, any vehicle. So uh, knock on wood, as they say, but we're, we're in a good place, I think, as far as that's concerned. And they are making a lot of improvements to the streetscape. Uh, the bridge is being redone right now, part of the sidewalk, and then there's a phase two. This is a county project with some federal funds. So from the bridge that crosses the river all the way down to Market Street, where the Patterson Museum is, that whole streetscape and the sidewalks and lighting and railings that's all going to be rehabilitated as a part of that county road project. So, you know, it it's going to only improve, I think, not only the, the, the experience, but the safety of walking around the National Park here. Uh, next question is, um, are there is there any news or progress on replacing the bridge over the falls? As of now, no. That's uh, that's something we we are having continuing discussions with the owner of the footbridge, the Passaic Valley Water Commission, and talking with them and other partners about how we can quickly move to either get some repairs done, or if need be, according to their engineers, we may need to actually replace the bridge. So uh, that that's a, a very important artery for the visitor. The visitor has an expectation when they visit the Great Falls that they can walk over the footbridge 
Uh, as of now, it's closed. Um, if you want to get to the other side of the river, you can. You have to walk the sidewalk along the Wayne Avenue Bridge. But we are we are certainly aware, and people make us aware quite frequently that the footbridge is closed, and um, we're prioritizing that, trying to figure out a way to quickly move it. The next question is about and more about the national parks as a system. Um, they're asking what other national historical parks are there? Actually, the first park with that designation of National Historical Park is the Morristown National Historical Park, which is just 20 minutes from us. It's a, it's a great site and it's a historical park commemorating um, Washington's, uh, the, the, the Rev Army's winters that they spent at Jockey Hollow. Actually, it was, it was a far worse winter than even Valley Forge but it doesn't get quite the, uh, the amount of play that that, that Valley Forge National uh, Historical Park gets. But Morristown is, is uh, Washington headquarters is right, right outside of downtown uh, Morristown at the Ford Mansion. That's where Washington was holed up during that winter. And then you go south on 287, you get to Jockey Hollow, which is where the encampment was. So that's, a, that's the earliest, first, and closest example of another National Historical Park. And Edison, sorry, um, Edison National Historical Park is, is in West Orange. So if you want to see uh, the Edison Labs, um, including one of his first videos, which was of the Great Falls, uh, you can visit Thomas Edison's labs at, in, in West Orange. You can also go to Llewellyn Park, which is a part of the National Park, just down the street, and visit his home, uh, which is a beautiful home where he has uh, his, his, his office and, and also some of the outbuildings where uh, you see early electrical vehicles in a garage that Edison owned long before Tesla, actually at the same time as Tesla, right, Jack? Um, yeah, so uh, that's another close park uh, here to uh, Patterson. So you can go to Edison one way, Morristown the other, and you're, you're in other equally uh, uh, important, significant national historical parks right here in North Jersey. So we've actually got a question about Edison. They're wondering if Edison's laboratory was water powered. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. I was trying to no. think. No. I think that was good old fashioned electricity, but Jack, would you know? I we're we're, yeah, we're talking I'm about you guys on that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? You have any announcements, Heather, or anything? Yeah. Else? Sure. Um. So thank you everybody for um, attending. Thank you, Darren. This was thank you. This is really great. Um, and, a, and a great contribution. Uh, unfortunate that we couldn't do it in person, but, uh, but Zoom works too. Um, the next presentation that uh, the museum, actually it's the Patterson Museum Foundation is gonna be sponsoring is gonna happen uh, in, on March 22nd, which is a Tuesday. Uh, Richard Poulton is going to be presenting on Zoom and his presentation is called Patterson, Change, Patterson Comes of Age, The Rise of an American City, which is about the Victorian architecture of Patterson. So if you're interested in that program, um, you can email me and I'll get your email uh, to the right place. Um, also, the Patterson Museum Foundation and their other uh, recurring Zoom series, which is with Passaic County historian Ed Smike, called The Story Behind the Story. Um, he's going to come back on March 31st, which is a Thursday, and Ed is going to talk about Mark Twain visiting Patterson, which until he told me that he was going to do that, I didn't realize that Mark Twain had visited Patterson, so that should be interesting. Um, the next meet event that we're going to have in person at the museum is going to be on April 2nd. Uh, we're going to be celebrating the beginning of National Poetry Month uh, with a program called Power of Words, Patterson Poetry, Past and Present. 
And this is going to be in collaboration with WordSeed Inc, who we're working with very closely on a variety of pe uh, poetry related workshops and events. And it's gonna be include featured poets, but also have some open mic opportunities for the attendees. And that's gonna start at five o'clock on April 2nd, which is a Saturday. And then that, as I said, is starting off our National Poetry Month programming. We're going to have a couple of other programs uh, related to poetry in person at the museum through the month of April. And you can find all that on our website. Wow. We're just as busy as you, partner. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. again, I, I want to thank everyone. Again, Heather, I appreciate your uh, providing your skills tonight. As well as we get, we did get to hear Hannah in the background for a few seconds there, singing child. Uh, Darren, you know, I, I want to thank you actually over the 10 years. You've been great. I love my shirt. You know, we, everyone at the Patterson Museum, we have official staff shirts, courtesy of the National Parks Assistant. So I, I do want to thank you for that. And I do appreciate everyone who's been following us regularly. And I hope those who've tuned in for the first time, you, you check out some of our previous uh, lectures that we've held over Zoom uh, on our uh, YouTube channel, and as well as future things that are going on, either check us out on Facebook or our website. And, or our Instagram. Oh, Instagram. Uh, I'm too old for Instagram, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, thank you, friends. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.